I know you see what's on the board here today. What is faith? <coughs> how do I how do I get faith? And how do I use faith? What the heck do I need this faith for anyway? <laughs> right? Do I need any faith? Absolutely, yeah, of course. You do, right? Mm -hmm. So as I promised during our we were we were doing a summer series the practical principles that we can do in our lives during the summer to really get us into that place and my prayer is at the end of the summer we'll have some really good practical principles so that we can get to another level in the Lord in our lives <clears throat> so if you would I don't know if you have your scriptures on you your Bibles on you <laughs> they're gonna go See, Neil has his. I got a lollipop. He's like the most rebellious student in the room. <laughs> I got a lollipop. Is that a big prince? Yeah. <laughs> she didn't want the lollipop. You're the so old I... guy. He's the older guy. That's and really you got not the bigger true. Print? I really want right. it. Okay, we're doing good. All right. We are recording. Yep. <laughs> yep, we'll take this out and put it in a special own thing. <laughs> Neil has lollipop. Neil needs a lot of attention. <laughs> All right. So we're going to be in Genesis chapter 15. I'm going to read you a quick story, and then I'm not going to go through... Oh, we, I won't make you turn to all the scriptures, but I'll repeat them So if you want to get them. But this is where we begin to see faith being activated. Genesis chapter 15, starting with verse 1. <clears throat> and I tried them right on the board, so Mary had a visual. <laughs> so, what is faith? How do I get faith, and how do I use faith? Everybody find it? Genesis 15? Yes, sir. And after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, for I am thy shield and thy exceedingly great reward. And Abram said unto the Lord God, What wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus. And Abraham, Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given me no seed, and lo, one born of my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thy heir, but he that shall come forth out of thy bowels shall be thy heir. And he brought him forth abroad and took and, and said, Look now toward the heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them, and he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted unto him for righteousness. You heard in the scripture this morning, when we were doing Mass this morning, it talked about three angels, or three men, it says, that came to visit Abraham. And he was outside of his tent. Sarah was on the inside of the tent. And these three strange characters show up at the at his tent. And he, of course, you know what he does? He runs into the town to tell Sarah to make some bread. And he goes out into the field, picks out a calf, right? And tells one of his servants to prepare it for a feast for these three men. What God is trying to show us in that story is that God is doing something that is totally new in the hearts and the minds of men and women. Who, anybody know who Abraham represents in Scripture? What is he the father of? Blessings. Blessings. Let's keep going. Israel. A what? Israel. It's the blessing of Israel? Okay. Abraham? Yeah. What is he, what is he, what is his role? What is father he the father of, of? Father of many sons. Many sons, okay. Many nations. Nations. Many nations. Many nations. Um, this is, like a, this is like a guest show. Everybody wants the He's blessing. He's the father of faith. 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 Father of faith. He's the father of faith. And faith is what? Um. You can't. You can't see. You can't see. Faith is in one word. What is it? Um. I just read it to you. <laughs> In one word, what is faith? What is faith in one word? What is faith? Fear. It's fear? No, it's the opposite of faith. Oh, it's the opposite. So it's the opposite of faith is fear? Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Faith is confidence. Right? We've learned that before, right? Oh, yeah, Faith right. Yeah. is confidence. So why would I need confidence? How about if I walked around with zero confidence in my life? <laughs> what kind of life do you think I would have? You're afraid of everything. You'd be afraid of everything? you lock your doors and then jump under the covers. And jump under the covers, hope it all go away. <laughs> right? <clears throat> and most of us feel that way sometimes. In some times in our, others in our life. So faith is confidence. What was the faith that Abram was having in? What was the faith? Because listen to what it says in verse 6. And he believed God, and he counted unto him for righteousness. He believed God, and he was counted unto him for righteousness, or for justice, or for, for the word actually is used there as zadik. That he was, because the, the righteous live by faith, it says in Habakkuk. All right? So, Abram learn, was learning to live by faith, and he was an old man at this point. He had just met Melchizedek, all right? And what does he say to God? He says, he says to, first the Lord comes to him and says, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, for I am thy shield and thy exceedingly great reward. Abraham said, Lo, Lord God, why wilt thou, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? What is happening in the story? <clears throat> Think about it. What's going on? He's an old man. He's been praying for a child for years, if you know the story, right? And yet he hasn't received his promise. And he goes back, God says to him that you're going to be blessed. He says, well, that's great, God, but heck, I don't have no heirs. Except for this, except for, you know, the steward of my household, Eleazar, okay? Which means God is my helper, by the way. Of Damascus, God is my helper. What was the word? Eleazar. That's his name. All right? So Abraham said unto the Lord God, Wilt thou give me, seeing that I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus. And Abraham, because normally what would happen in tradition is that if they go childless, the, the steward of the house would receive the wealth and it would go on. So Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given me no seed. And lo, one born of my house is not my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, What's he talking about? He's talking about Uh, Isaac and Jacob. No. Isaac. Isaac and what? He's talking about the son that was born in his household that wasn't his heir. Who was it? There was a lot with it. No. No, no it was his Isaac, nephew. Uh, Isaac and uh, Isaiah. Right. Ishmael. Yeah. Remember Ishmael? Oh, yeah, from the, the maiden. Right. Okay, because he tried to do it himself. He conspired with his wife, <clears throat> right, Sarah? And there was an old law back in those days that said, hey, if your wife can't have any children, then you do this, and it will be still be... And when, once that child was born, Sarah rejected it anyway. Hmm. It's called a concubine. So don't think about getting one. You'll probably have your head cut off. <laughs> His head? <laughs> Anybody's head. <laughs> I don't think it'll work this day. It means that you have other wives that you're not married to. <laughs> they call them concubines, yeah. So anyway, what I'm trying to show you is, is that there's this, this is, this is, there's this event that's taking place over a long period of time here. It wasn't just something that happened. God was teaching and training Abram to do what? To become the father of faith. Even though he was, an old, he was in his, I think he was probably, I'm assuming, between 80 and 90 years old at this point. Talk about impossible. Right? Women don't even have their period by then anymore in their life, let alone, okay? 
You see, was it? I think it was Mick Jagger. Somebody's yes, having a baby. <laughs> in the news this week. He's seventy years old. He's seventy-two years old or something like that. He's having a baby with some twenty-nine-year-old girl. Yeah, she's twenty-nine. What? I thought the Jackson girl was old. She's having one. She's fifty-something. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Janet. Janet Jackson. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm trying to show you is, is that it's really physically impossible at this point in life. And even Sarah admits this is impossible because what happens in the story that we read earlier is that this day next year, this time next year, you will have a son. Impossible. So, what is faith then? If faith is confidence, how do I get this faith? That I could have this faith because it was by faith that Abraham became what he became in his life because he had no actual means of becoming what God was telling him. Are you following me so far? What does that tell you about you and I? I'm trying to show you a secret to life. Because this is something that you can put into action in your life today. Not something that's far off. This character, Abraham, teaches you how to live by faith. Is it easy? No. Was it easy for Abraham? It was something he had to learn to activate in his life. Okay? I won't ask millions of questions, but I want to show you how this works. So you begin to, it begins to coalesce in your life. And how can you use this faith today? Because what's the only thing that truly pleases God? Doesn't the Word of God say faith? So what is God doing to Abram? It's teaching him how to do what? To become faithful. So, what does he put? What position now is he putting Abraham in? <clears throat> does he just hand it to him on a silver platter? No. No, he a lot of trials. No. That's what he does with you know Mary. He hands everything on a silver platter. You know, she prays and it happens. <laughs> he put. Abram in a position where he says, well, God, if you keep promising me these promises, then there's only one way this is going to work. I need a kid that you say is my promised heir from Sarah. That's the only way it's going to happen. Isn't that what it says? <clears throat> and he brought him forth abroad. So listen to what happens. This is really interesting. He says, Abram says to the Lord God, What wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is not my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thy heir, but he that came forth from thy own bowels shall be thy heir. Listen to what it says now. And behold, and he brought him forth abroad and said, Look toward heaven and tell the stars if thou art able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Holy mackerel. Is he crazy? God, God has lost his mind. He just took, now he takes Abraham and he shows him a vision. He says it, he took him abroad, right? That's not what it said, right? He took him like in a vision. He took him and he showed him and he showed him all the stars in the sky and he said, can you count them? Of course you can't count them. There's too many to count, right? How can you count them? I'll take you billions of years. And God says that not only are they, can you count? He's asking him to count them. In another scripture he says he's named all the stars. So he brings him into a place of infinite value. Are you seeing that now? Infinite value. Where is the one place in your life that has infinite value? Your heart? The, the, the one place? The one place that you can go that has infinite value. Does it have to be uh, Jesus Christ the Lord? Well, it's even more specific than your heart and mind. So what is it called? <clears throat> what? Soul. Your shoulder? Soul. soul. Your soul? But it's within you, though, Father? Yeah, it's in you. What is it called? Your 
Your life has infinite value. Most of us sit around, think our lives are limited. So that can't be infinite value. We think we're going to die. <laughs> the Bible says contrary, but we're going to die. <laughs> what is the one place? I, you've got to catch this. It's really important. There's one place inside of you that has, the, has infinite value. It's called soul. Oh. Your soul has soulish desires. Your spirit. Ears, eyes, mouth. You, you know this thing. You use it every single day of your life. Your mouth. Your mouth? Most of the stuff that comes out of our mouths has, doesn't have infinite value. In fact, many times it yeah. puts us in jail. <laughs> your feet, your feet, you use it to walk. Yeah, how far can you walk? I'm walking. Infinitely? <laughs> You'll die. Yeah. It's your your imagination. Ah, oh, come on. Your imagination. <laughs> All right? Isn't it your imagination? Right now, you could close your eyes, you could be in New York City. Right now, you close your eyes, you could be in Russia. Right now, you close your eyes, and you could smell a rose. Do you see a rose? No. Do you feel a rose? No. Can you smell a rose? Can you imagine that you're feeling a rose? Yes. But when you open your eyes in the physical world, do you see one? No. But if I ask you to close your right now and meditate and close your eyes and imagine what it would smell like, you guys could describe that smell to me easily, right? Because you know what a rose smells like. Well, what is Abraham being asked to do? He's asking by counting the number of the stars to imagine something that he has a hard time relating to. Isn't that what God is doing to him? So what is he doing to him? He is training him to do something that is uncomfortable for him. How is this going to happen, Lord? Seeing that I do not have a seed, there is no way it is impossible. The facts tell me that Eleazar is going to get it. My servant from Damascus. My facts tell me that this is going to happen, that this is going to happen. No! God says he takes into his imagination and he says, take a look at the infinite world that you live in. Isn't that what he's telling him to do? <clears throat> he said, and he brought him forth abroad and he said, look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou art able to number them. And he said unto him, God says, so shall thy seed be. And so what did Abraham do? He believed God. But he had no evidence to believe him. Because everything was antithetical. That means opposite of that belief. Are you following this now? This is a secret that you can use in your life every single day of your life. It is a principle that is laid out in the, his, in, in, in the very foundation of the universe. <clears throat> and I can prove it. Take a look at the camera that's filming us today. Everybody just take a look at it. Where do you think that framework was first made? Someone's mind. In someone's imagination. Someone's infinite imagination. And then someone took the camera and they started out with it. They know that, <clears throat> I'll give you an example. Henry Ford. Everybody knows who Henry Ford is, right? Mm -hmm. He came up with the idea in his imagination that he could make a, cheap, uh, a car cheaper and for the masses. Told his dad. And he began to become obsessed with the fact that he could do this. You guys know the story? Well, he was a smart guy. He was at, back in those days, making, he was making $25 an hour. That was a lot of money back then. That was like making, that was a lot of money. It's a lot of money. His father sat him down. He says, Henry, have you lost your mind? Mm -hmm. You gotta get you. You're obsessed with the fact that you think that you can make cars cheaper and better, and for the masses. And you're willing to risk your twenty-five dollar hour job mm -hmm. to do that? Are you following me so far? Mm -hmm. Because what happened to him? <clears throat> because of him, today all of us are driving around in cars. Because they got a lot more expensive today. <laughs> But we're all driving around in a car. Because why? It started out in his imagination and he didn't believe the facts. The fact, if he just said, you're right, Dad, you know, maybe I should just live with my $25 an hour job back in here, what, 1920-something probably, whatever it was. I guess maybe before that, maybe I forgot when he was 
like in 18, uh, maybe before the turn of the century. And yet we look at our lives and we ask ourselves the question, how can I put faith into my life? How can I use faith in my life? Because I'm limited by what? What I see, what I feel, what I touch, what people tell me. If God says to Abraham, faith, take a look at the numbers of the scars in the sky. Can you count them? No, Lord. Well, I'm telling you that you're going to have your relatives, your prodigy is going to be like the stars of the sky. Impossible. To the eyes and to the facts of life. Not only was he old, but he was very old in our eyes. His wife was past the time when you could even have children. And yet God is telling him this. So the facts you never, ever, when you held something by faith in your imagination, you never believe the facts. Are you seeing this now? Listen to what it says. Okay. I'm just going to go to, uh, I'm just going to go to the scriptures. All right. Habakkuk 2.4. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. That's Habakkuk 2.4. The just, the righteous, those that are following God, who are blessed by God, are living how? Like Abraham. You see that? By faith. And what God is doing, He puts you in a position where you have to believe that which is impossible. Do you see that? We don't receive faith and have the training of God come into our life when everything's going good. When does it happen? When it's a struggle. When it is a struggle. Go to, to Mark. Uh, you don't have to look at it. If you want Matthew chapter 9, verse 29, if you want to look at it, but I'll read it to you. Matthew 9, 29. Then touched he their eyes and saying, according to your faith, be it unto you. <gasps> According to your faith, he says to the blind man, the two blind guys, he says that you can be, you're going to be, you're going to be healed. How? According to what? Faith. The measure of your faith. And what is faith? Confidence. Confidence in what? Imagination. Confidence in no, not just imagination. Your belief. Your belief that everything is possible even though the facts say differently. Are you seeing that now? So how in the world does this work? Let's look at another place. Romans chapter 119. You don't have to look it up. Therein is the righteousness of God revealed. For faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Well, wherein is the, is the righteousness of God revealed? How is it revealed? Faith to faith. Believing those things that are not as if they wow. were. But knowing those things from the end, from? The beginning. What does that mean? You have faith to see something from the starting from You know what it's going to look end. like. You know what it's going to look like. And you see it now. Right. <clears throat> Right? Okay. So, let's go to, I'm just going to, uh, it, it's uh, Hebrews 11.1, 1. I'll read it. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh, is, cometh to God, is, God must believe. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that who? Diligently seek him. So how do I receive faith? Okay, how do I get it? Seeking him. By seeking him? Um, diligently seeking him. Not just seeking him, not like this. Lord, I'm just going to pray that everything's going to be okay. <laughs> yeah, it's okay, let's go. Right? <laughs> 
It's like our singing today. Can't wait to eat my Cheerios. <laughs> right? You've got to put your heart into it. But I'm not talking about your outside here. I'm talking about inside. Where did God take Abram when he, began to, when he was teaching about how to live by faith? Where did he take him? Did he take him to his foot? Oh, that's what, you know, Neil thinks. <laughs> he took him to his imagination and he asked him to count the number of the stars. He took him out of this world and he brought him into an infinite place. And he, a place where he could imagine. And what did it say? He believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. How do the godly live? Righteous. By faith. The righteous live by faith. Right? So you're going to live by faith. And you're going to receive that faith many times through the trials and tribulations of your life. Because you're going to have to learn how to do it. You're going to have to learn to put into practice in your life. You might come to a point, I was listening to a story last night. The story went like this. There was this guy who got into a tiff with his boss at work. God, honest truth, I heard this story. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> and anyway, what the guy had to do was, is he, had, he got in this tiff, he wasn't happy, he wasn't happy with how he was getting paid or whatever. It, 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 this is a great story. I, I mean, personally, I love the story because it makes a lot of sense to me. But anyway, <laughs> instead of, what he had to do was, he got into a tiff with him, he had to go home, he had to take a look at himself and say, what am I doing wrong, Lord? And the Lord showed him that he had to rearrange what, how he was seeing things. And so how he did it was, is he said, okay, I'm going to believe that, that I'm going to see God working in his life, in the positive of my life. What had happened was that he had criticized him, like, you're bad, you don't do this right, you don't do that right. right? In fact, if you keep doing this, we're going to have to probably let you go anyway. He became afraid. And that's not faith, is it? So he believed in faith and he believed God and he imagined what it would be like, okay, if right now, in the present tense, that this boss was thanking him and praising him for the great job he was doing. Goes to work. Stays faithful to that vision that he sees. That's the infinite. Are you following me now? Faith, fidelity. Faithfulness is fidelity. That means that you are faithful to, the, to what you are holding on to, right? Once he held on to it, and he was faithful to it, right? Would you believe that the boss comes up to him and says, great job, you did such a good job, I'm going to give you a raise. And then, this guy, learning how to live by faith, realizes it's still not the greatest job, but even though he got a raise, he went out, and ask the Lord for a brand new job. Mm. Right? Within two weeks, he had a brand new job at 20% more pay than that job. Because why? He was no longer bound by the fears and the insecurities and the controlling of the outside world. What was he relying on? On his belief, his faith. On his faith in what? That God was with him. That God was with him and that God would bless him even though the world was saying just the opposite. Are you seeing that now? So you can bring this into your every single day life. In your every single day life. I mean, there's, there, you can hear stories about, like, you know, um, give you an example. You might hear that, that somebody believes in faith and they put their faith in God and they got fired. Well, my idea would be is that, that God wanted it that way in order to position you for what? To receive what God has wanted in your life. It happened in this room. We won't mention names because he likes the attention of God. <laughs> <laughs> because it positions you for the blessing of God. That same faith gives you the ability to bring what? Once you start living that way, what happens to you inside? Change. A change takes place, doesn't it? You begin to change inside. Life, you begin to look at life in a whole new way and you're not bound 
by all the things around you that tell you the law of love. So when you pray for somebody, you're in a bad situation, look within and have compassion for the person, place, or thing that is holding you back. But see it differently. That's what God was asking Abraham to do, wasn't it? So how do I get this faith? Well, one of the ways is through the trials and tribulations of your life because it forces you to activate their faith. When the blind men were able to see, God said, Jesus said what? You will receive sight according to what? According to your faith. How much faith do you have? What do you do with that faith? Do you exercise your faith? Believe me. This is uh, something that you will struggle with, but you have to learn how to do it because it's already there for you. Isaac, who would take over the prodigy, that means the line of Abraham, was already there for him. It only had to come flourish to, to flourishing. How many months does it take for a child to be born? So how long did he have to hold on to that faith that when those three angels came along and told him that they were going to have a child and this time next year it would be born? How long did he have to hold on? And what was Sarah doing inside? Laughing. Ha. Shall I reflect pleasure? My husband. I mean, give me a break. Hey, hon, if we do the wild thing, <laughs> and you're, I know you're about 89 years old or whatever she was <laughs> we're going to have a child she probably rolled her eyes <laughs> thought she was crazy do not believe the facts are you following me so far even though it seems like it's impossible do not believe the facts are not real not if you're living by faith so how do I get faith? faith comes by what? Hearing. By hearing what? And believing the word of God in my life. Yeah. In where? In the infinite place of my imagination. That is where he does it. Are you get, can you see this now in your everyday life? You've got a vision for it? I see it, Paul. I see if it. I was you, I would <laughs> practice using this tool. How do I practice using it? In little ways. Okay, Father Leo, I'm probably not going to become President of the United States and probably don't want to become President of the United States. But you could become President of the United States. According to your faith, who wants, I don't know who in the heck would want to be one right now. I'd rather live, you know, some other way. You have to go into that place where you see yourself, what your calling is, know what it is. I can't just tell you what it is. You've got to know what it is inside of you. You know, in fact, if we go deep inside of ourselves, we know who we are. We know what God has called you to. Are you faithful to that calling? Are we faithful to that calling? You're not called to be president or else probably you would have been on a different track of life. I'm not called to be president. I'm called to do what I'm doing right now, which is to speak what? The word of? faith <laughs> to do what to encourage you so that you could begin to prosper in your life and not have the needs that you have and guess what I gotta do the same thing to myself I gotta find that word of faith and what do you think I do and I bring it to you because what the righteous live by what faith it's what you call a devar Reality. You know what Dabar means? It's a word. A Dabar reality. Remember, how did God make things in the world? How did he make the world? He spoke into it. And where was that speech? We've taught you on it. Where was that speech? Was that just right here? No, inner. That's inner. Inner speech. Your inner speech is what creates your reality. So, let's go back to looking at our lives. The facts tell you this is impossible. Where was Abraham when he received this vision from God, took him to a place? He was in his imagination. He was in an infinite place. 
He was inside, and he believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Where? From within. How many of us practice this on the outside, but not on the inside? We say, well, we're going to trust God for this. I don't know how this is going to happen. This is impossible. I think, this, I think Father Leo might be, have lost his mind. <laughs> is he crazy? Are you kidding me? Are you following me so far? I'm just using that as an example. you got to sit down. And get into that place. And sometimes it will take you a couple days to do it. It doesn't take a minute. This takes practice. And you get into that infinite place where you begin to look at those things that seem infinite to you. And you try to count them and you realize you cannot count them. And you say, Lord, your word says you said that I will become the father of many nations. He became to us the father of faith. And by believing in that, it was counted unto him for righteousness. And the world, the whole structure of the world, relies on the people of God who live by faith. It says the foundation of the world is built on faith. Oh, that's amazing. So I'm giving you the very foundational concept of understanding it. This concept was before the tabernacle of the wilderness, before all the laws that came out, before all that stuff. Because all those things were just designed to get you back to this point where you learn to live by faith and be, have fidelity to what you believe in. Apostle Paul had it. He believed that he was going towards the high calling, the Word of God says, right? And that's where he was trying to come to, the high calling of Christ in his life. You and I, we're just trying to get by the day, pay our bills, to work through our life. And if you learn to do this, you will not only find out that you can pay all your bills and that you can have everything taken care of in your life, but you will also learn how to begin to bring yourself into a place where you can imagine yourself doing even greater things. That nothing is impossible. Isn't that what the Word of God says? All things are possible through what? Christ. Through Christ Jesus. Nothing is impossible. Whatever you ask for in prayer is going to be whose? Yours. Yours. And how do you have to ask? With desire. Coming from that place. Using the law of love. That means you're not going to condemn somebody. You're not going to hurt somebody. It's going to come to you. And you might lose on the shorthand, but you will gain because guess what? It's already yours because it has been there since the foundation of the world. Are you, are you seeing this so far? This is important to understand because this is how God begins to move in our lives. And now you're living by faith. In who? The Son of God, who opened the door for you, who gave his life for you, so that you might what? Live by faith. So that you might live a, a life of uh, having some victories in your life, having dominion in your life, not being a victim anymore. And all around you will tell you differently. The people around you will. The, everything in your life will remind you of your past. Correct? It doesn't it always, and the bad decisions that you made, and you'll be reminded of them, and you get angry because of those things sometimes. Those are the facts. And those facts cannot be believed because guess what? Jesus died so that you could be free of the facts of life, didn't he? Well, sorry, uh, you know, I guess I only died for you so that you could feel good at church on Sunday. <laughs> do you think that would be the way it works <laughs> but when you go out there you know uh, you know you got your past is going to catch up to you people are going to remind you what an idiot you are right that's not what god called you to come on god called you to do what to live by faith and the provision of god comes from where And when you learn to live this way, you'll come back to me with stories, guarantee you. You say, I don't know. It seemed almost natural that it would come to me this way. Everything has its time of incubation. But everything has its day 
the birth. That's what the Word of God says. It will come to pass. So if I'm going to learn to live by faith, I'm going to be hold the fidelity to what? To what I believe God is asking me of my life. And He's not asking you to be broke. He's asking you to have. He's, uh, he says, you will prosper. He says that I will fill your cup to overflowing. Doesn't he say that? He wants to give you the very best. But where does it got to come from? You. Inside of you. The biggest handicap that we give people is that we try to take care of them on the outside. What does it say on that sign up there, Mary? You're the only one that can see it. I live by faith. Walk by faith, not by sight. Walk by faith not by outside sight. This takes practice of learning to get into that inner closet. Could you imagine? Jesus was with the disciples. One day he looks at them and says, now do you get it? Now do you understand? How much longer must I suffer with you? He was trying to teach them this principle. Peter, who was I, when you think about Peter, in my mind, I think of him as a beer-drinking, sports-watching kind of a guy, fisherman on Sea of Galilee, you know, if he had TVs back then and Budweiser. <laughs> right? I have no idea what he was like. But when Jesus comes to him in his boat, right, he, he does the impossible with Peter, doesn't he? Peter's out all night fishing. And what happens? He catches nothing. Comes ashore, Jesus says, go cast your net onto the right side of the boat and you'll receive. Jesus, we've been fishing all night. I'm not gonna catch nothing. <laughs> the facts, are you following me so far? The facts tell you, listen, I have been working all these years and nothing seems to work. That's what Pete was saying to him. So don't tell me I'm the professional fisherman. You're just this dandy guy walking along the beach. What am I going to listen to you for? That's what I know. That's what Neil would say to the poor guy. <laughs> you miss it. You're like, you know, I'm fishing right now. Get out. <laughs> what are you going to do now? You're going. And what did Peter do? Peter stepped out intrinsically by faith, and he puts the net out. All right, Lord, I'll give it a shot. And what happens? Immediately, fish jump into his net. And that's like catching the biggest job in the world with lots of money. You know what I mean? Back then, that's what his job was. Can you imagine? He caught all his... So big was the catch that he yet had to go get his brothers to help him. This was their business. And now for the next three and a half years, Peter is trained. Imagine what Jesus said to him when he was on the Sea of Galilee one day. And it's night and it's stormy. And he sees a ghost walking on the Sea of Galilee and he realizes it's Jesus. Can you imagine what Peter had been taught before that? When he says, Jesus, if it's really you, call me to walk on water. Jesus must have been teaching him something beforehand. And what did Peter do? He got out of the boat. Jesus said, come. He got out of the boat and began to walk on water. As soon as he looked at the facts, what were the facts? It was a blustery wind blowing and the waves were huge and he could and he realized that this isn't looking too good. I might die out here, right? And what happened? He began to sink. Jesus was teaching Peter to do what? Walk by faith, not by sight. Look at your life. Are you learning to walk by faith? And even when he began to sink, Jesus, Peter cries out to him, Lord, save me. And immediately he was picked up. Are you getting this so far? These are simple stories that teach you and I how to live by faith. So now can you see how you use faith? In Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we believe God by faith, by what? Knowing what? It increases in our life as we learn to know the word of God. Because what was the word of God designed to do? To help you increase your faith. So faith comes by hearing. 
How do you, you know, if you're going to smell a rose and you've, ever, and you've never seen a rose in your entire life, could you smell one? You think it smells like Mary. Because <laughs> you only can't see Mary. Because <laughs> they call her Rose. <laughs> what happens? You have a picture in your mind. You're using your imagination. You begin to see. You're picturing what it would be like. Do you know that that's exactly, if you were to go to a scientist, would tell you that's how the human mind works. It works by pictures. That's why when you dream, when you have a dream, you try to figure out what the... Dream, dream picturing is, right? What the symbols are. Are you following me so far? The whole world is that way. The other thing about faith is it's a gift of God. Some people are given more faith than another. Why is that? I don't know. Some people are given the gift of being able to do one thing and heal others and all that kind of stuff. Faith is given by measure, and it's something that needs to be exercised in your life. Okay? In Ephesians 2.8 it says, And for by grace ye are saved, through faith, and that not of yourself, it is a gift of God. So, how do we get faith? It says, this verse says right here, For by grace ye are saved, through faith, through faith, because why? It's the foundation of the universe, faith. Because it's the activation of what? Your imagination. It's a fidelity to what you believe of yourself. So if you have a bad belief in yourself, what is your life gonna look like? It's gonna be exactly what you imagine it's gonna be. Are you seeing that? We gotta see it. And guess what? You can change it. Do you believe that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you, are you prepared to go through what it might take to get to that place in your life? Absolutely. You have to be. That means you have to hold true to what fidelity means? No. It means to be faithful to. To be, to have, like, you know, you pledge your fidelity to your wife or to your husband. You're doing that where? In your heart, right? You pledge your fidelity, and with this ring, I do thee wed, I do wed thee. Fidelity to a thought. Obviously, at one day, you thought that was a great thought. <laughs> but when you hold true to that fidelity and you follow through on it, what happens? What's that called? It's called a marriage. <laughs> I'm asking you to see that principle in your heart and in your imagination that you have the ability to go within yourself and to bring together those parts of you that do not believe, okay, and that are not faithful, because there are parts of you that are not faithful, and what happens to us? We follow it. But you become faithful to what? To what God is telling you in your life. And that takes holding it. You know what I mean by holding it? You ever seen a young girl, when she gets married, what does she do? She goes to the ring store. She imagines what it's going to be like to wear that ring, right? She goes to the dress store and she sees the dress. That is the dress that I would want to be married in, right? Don't they do that? And if, even if you go into the dress store, they start looking through magazines and they start imagining what it would be like to do that. That's called prayer. That's called prayer. You're imagining. You're looking, you're going into that place just like Abraham was brought to. And you are imagining what it would be like if you were the father of many nations and you were the father of faith. It was by faith that you and I, because Abraham suffered through that for all those years until he was over a hundred years old, you and I have the ability to learn to live by faith. And the way you do it is going to be for those of your children and those you're connected with and your friends, and your family, and, and your church brothers and sisters. So what's the best thing that your church brothers and sisters could do for you? Right. Encourage you to live by faith. Right? And to be there with you as you learn to suffer through the consequences of it. 
Because the Word of God teaches us the only consequences are going to be good. And you're going to come back with a story that encourages your brother and sister. That's the Word. It's a testimony of the promise that you live through it. And you're able to tell that it works. And that's what encourages others. So where does faith come from? Faith is propagated from one person to another. So what is my job? To propagate faith. To propagate your faith. I don't know and what to hold. Means. But propagate means to give birth to, to constantly oh, okay. get it like a rabbit. <laughs> and what, what, would I, what would happen if I, if I held back on that <clears throat> principle? Everything would shut down. It wouldn't be so good because who activates faith? Remember, Genesis 2, verse 5. What does it say? Anybody remember? Gen read it. Genesis 2, verse 5. <clears throat> Who is the operator of faith? Ready? Let's see if... if, if uh, Yeah, just no, the verse the verse five. Want to read it? Chapter two, verse five. <clears throat> you want me to read it? Uh, oh, okay. you got to read it right in front of me. Am I in the right spot? Two, two five. five. Two five. Right. Yep. <clears throat> and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord has not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. Okay. You hear that? I know I bring that scripture up a lot. Mm -hmm. It's my favorite. It's the scripture that opened up the entire Bible to me personally. I pray that you have one. Before That means that it existed before it was a fact. Do you see that? It existed before it was a fact. Every plant of the field before every herb of the field, before, right? And Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. Why? Because there was yet no man to do what? Activate faith. You activate faith and what happens? All these things grew. grew. They were there already, under the ground, in you already. Are you seeing this? This faith that we talk about has been around since the foundation of the world, of the universe, of everything that exists. That's exciting. You seeing it now? Can you, you can feel it. You can see it. You can touch it. And when you go out into the world, when you step out this door, you're going to learn how to hold to the fidelity of what God has asked for. Whatever you ask for in prayer, in faith, believing, it is whose? Yours. Yours. Because why? Every before there was a, a tree, before there were herbs, before they were already there, it was only waiting and it had not rained upon the earth because there was yet no man to activate faith. You are the activator of faith. Didn't Jesus say you received that because of why? You received the healing because? <clears throat> you believe it. Because of your faith. Isn't that all throughout Scripture? 